All right, so we're in Acts chapter 4. Uh, Acts 4, we're going to look at the first 31 verses this morning. So Acts 4, 1 through 31. The church has a real difficult history with persecution. Uh, from Nero burning Christians on crosses in response to the fires of Rome, to the drowning of Anabaptists at the hands of pretty much all other parties during the Reformation. And then you had the extreme tortures that came upon Christians during the Soviet regime. And then you also have the beheadings of those for their faith in Muslim countries today. Uh, the blood of Christians has been spilled again and again and again. And this morning in Acts chapter 4, we have the privilege of looking at the first occurrence of persecution in church history with one of the interesting notes that this is probably one of the lightest examples of persecution in history. One that probably contains some humor even if you can spot it in there. Uh, but sadly, what we know began as light persecution on the church uh, quickly turned dark after this point. Uh, but this morning, we're going to see the first instance of persecution, which is pretty much just like a slap on the wrist. Uh, let's not forget, though, that the depth of suffering that would occur after this point uh, for those who have endured shame for the name of Jesus Christ. So we have the recording of this first instance of persecution in verses 1 through 4. Now, as they spoke to the people, this is Peter and John speaking to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jerusalem and preached in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they laid hands on him, and they put them in custody, until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men who came to be came to be about 5,000. So following our passage last week in Acts 3, the healing of the lame man uh, outside of the beautiful gate of the temple, uh, the massive crowd that that healing created, uh, Peter continued to proclaim Jesus Christ and the glory of his power. And I'm guessing that what we have in chapter 3 is probably just a sample size of everything that Peter said that day following that healing. And we read that while Peter's continuing to talk to the crowd, that the captain of the temple comes and lays hands on Peter and John to place them in custody. Now, the captain of the temple was not a military role, but this was actually a priestly role. The captain of the temple was known as the second uh, in command priestly position at that time. So you would have the high priest who was the highest level of authority among the priesthood. And then second below them was the captain of the temple. And the captain of the temple had a charge to bring orderliness to the temple and also was responsible for all the activities of the temple to make sure that they would continue to go as planned. So his job was to make sure that nothing got out of order and to make sure that all the sacrifices happened when they were supposed to. Uh, he was given the power to arrest people in the temple, uh, but it was more for the uh, purpose of crowd control if need be. So it's probably no surprise that Peter and John, they begin to, to gather around them this massive crowd in the probably outer court of the temple that they would end up being taken aside and placed in custody simply to figure out what in the world is going on here. Like we can't have these crowds disturbing everything in the temple. So we got to take these guys and, and put them in custody just to figure out what is happening here. So this probably isn't what I would even call antagonistic persecution at this point. This is probably more just the temple of the, the captain of the temple, just he needs to make sure things are running smoothly. And so these people are creating a crowd, a disturbance for others. So they just got to, you know, put them aside so they can figure out what is going on here. So this isn't like a harsh type of persecution, uh, but a small persecution nonetheless. Uh, finally, note here that Luke tells us that 5,000 people came to believe in Jesus. I think that how it's worded that Luke isn't saying that 5,000 people came to believe 
that day in the temple. But what Luke is saying is that by the time you get to the end of this event with the healing of this lame man, you would have 5,000 converts in Jerusalem from the beginning of the church up to this point. So Luke is talking about the, the overall growth of the church from Pentecost to the day when this healing takes place. The church is growing. Uh, it's expanding. It's up to 5,000 people. And then we have Peter and John being persecuted for the first time by spending one night in prison. Uh, most likely that prison is probably a room in the temple itself. And then they're put on trial the next day. And we read about that in verses 5 through 12. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the high priest family, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be made known to all of you and to all of the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So we read here that the rulers have gathered together in order to cast a verdict against Peter and John. And so we want to notice a couple of things about this. First, uh, this is a Sadducee coalition that is charging Peter and John, uh, which makes sense because they were in the temple and the Sadducees were the priestly class rulers of that time period. Uh, so Sadducees was the, the group of the priests. The other noteworthy fact is that the Sadducees denied the resurrection altogether. They believe there would never be any resurrection for any of God's people. So for the followers of Jesus to now be proclaiming that Jesus has risen from the dead uh, would be attacking sort of the main fundamental of the Sadducees in comparison to the other Jewish religious groups of that day. So the priests would see this as a direct assault on them for Peter and John to be speaking of Jesus having risen from the dead. Uh, second thing as far as who is leading over this proceeding, uh, we see that it is Annas the high priest. Uh, Annas has been high priest for several years up to this point. And then you also have his father-in-law Caiaphas there. Caiaphas was at one time the high priest, but by this point he had not been high priest for about 20 years, um, but still functions with a lot of sway and power over his son-in-law who is also who is the high priest at this time. And then the other two people who are mentioned are Alexander and John. Uh, we have no idea who this Alexander is. It's, it's a common name. Uh, could be a number of people, or it could be no one that we know of. Uh, so we can't really speculate a lot on who that Alexander could be. But probably the most likely is that John is a son of Caiaphas. Uh, another son of Caiaphas, because there was also a John who would be a high priest after Annas, who would serve for a couple of short period, period of time, just a couple of years. So probably most likely this John is the next high priest who's going to come after Annas, Anias. So what's interesting is that there are actually a former high priest, the high priest, the future high priest, all there to try Peter and John. So they're bringing, you know, the most influential people of that time. Uh, but their accusation is interesting against them. It's probably what I think is the most interesting thing of this whole thing is the accusation. And that is, it's not even an accusation. They don't really even have anything to accuse them of, but really just a question, which is, who empowered you to heal this lame man? Which shows us that they didn't believe they had any standing to deny this miracle that occurred. That they, they couldn't be like, oh, you're trying to throw the wool over everybody's eyes. You're trying to deceive the people. No, no, they had to go at the, the power by which the miracle happened and not even if there was a miracle. Which then to see that is then like, you're like, well, what they need to do at this point then is basically throw Peter a softball question. 
Because if you think about it, what's the one question that Peter probably wanted to be asked going into these proceedings? The one question Peter probably wanted to be asked was, by whose power or in whose name did this miracle happen? And that's exactly what they ask to Peter. They asked Peter, what is the source of their power? And all Peter wanted to do was answer that question and to tell them that the source of their power was the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by which this man was raised from the dead. And I do just want to point out that Peter, Peter goes to this main point uh, that it was through Jesus that this man was healed, uh, which again would be a pretty embarrassing point for the Sadducees. Because what would the Sadducees say as the main point of their doctrine? There cannot be a resurrection. And so Peter is saying, well, I'm telling you how this resurrection happened. It was because Jesus rose from the dead, and now he's giving his power to us by which this miracle can occur. And then the other sort of, I think, kind of embarrassing thing about this is the fact that, you know, they're, they're like, tell us how this miracle happened. And Peter's able to be like, you know, it's weird that you're putting us on trial because we did something good. We did a good deed to help a homeless man, and that's why we're standing here today. And everybody knows that they did that good deed for that homeless, for that helpless man, because he's standing there with them. And it's that that point where I'd have to think that if you're watching these proceedings, and if you want to be pointing out who are the good guys or who are the bad guys here, you have to think the good guys are the people who empowered the lame beggars to walk. And the bad guys are the ones who wanted to imprison those who were empowering the lame man to walk. Uh, but Peter just gives a really great defense here, just showing how insane it is that Jesus did a miraculous work that allowed a man to walk. And now they're being put in prison because there was a beggar who couldn't walk, but now walks. You should be having a celebration over what occurred and not putting these guys on trial for what happened. And then Peter gets uh, theological for just a moment as he points out that the reason that Jesus was able to empower this man to walk is that Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And here he brings up Psalm 118, verse 22, that Jesus is the cornerstone that the Jews were prophesied to reject. So Peter, by bringing up this passage in Psalm 118, verse 22, uh, points out that Jesus not only has the power to raise the dead, Jesus has the power to heal this lame man because he is the cornerstone, but by bringing up this prophecy in Psalm 118, verse 22, Peter is also able to point out that what do we see about the cornerstone in Psalm 118? And that is the cornerstone will be rejected. People will trip over the cornerstone. So the fact that Jesus was rejected and hung on the cross, what should that tell you about him? That he has done what is needed to be fulfilled in order to be the cornerstone. That Jesus' death and martyrdom on the cross did not mean that Jesus was unable to be the Messiah, but it means that he actually fulfilled what would be required for him to be the Messiah. So Peter here uh, bringing up the theological backing for Jesus to be the Messiah through Psalm 118 verse 22. Uh, but this also prepares us really for all of church history to let us know that there are going to be times uh, where people in the church are going to do good. And their doing good will not lead to them being praised or thanked or congratulated for the good that they have done, but they will be accused of doing good. They will be persecuted and mocked for doing what is right. Uh, but my hope is that if we ever come upon those moments where we do good and we have wrong that is brought to us for the good that we are done, that we will lean on the power of the Spirit uh, to speak through us in that moment. Uh, and now in response to what Peter said, we now get the ruling of the Sadducees in verses 13 through 18. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against him. But when they commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, what shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, 
let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. So Luke tells us here that the Sadducees recognized uh, that they were at a loss at this moment. Uh, they could not keep this trial going because they, they could see what they were doing. And in the midst of this trial, they were accusing Peter and John of doing an undeniable good deed. And they knew we, we, can't, we can't go this way. Well, like even the, the cripple that they healed is standing before them. They can't do that. And so in their loss of words, they made what one secular historian called the most impactful political error in human history. So one historian wrote that the Sadducees here really had three options. Their three options here were, first, they could have ignored Peter and John entirely. Like this miracle could have happened with this lame man and they just could have pretended like it never happened and totally ignored it. Uh, the second option that they had is if they really wanted to stop these people going and talking about Jesus as the Messiah, they could have just killed him. They could have taken him into the back room, killed him, ended their life, totally stopped people from speaking about Jesus. But then they took a third option, which the historian says is the worst possible option. And that option is a very light punishment. Remember, the persecution was a single night in prison. So one night in prison and then a good, stern talking to. Any punishment that resulted in their release was the worst possible option. And the historian writes that because the apostles were not only sent back to tell more people about Jesus, but now they were sent back to tell more people about Jesus, and their message was enhanced because they were now martyrs for the cause. They had been persecuted and held in prison for speaking about Jesus, which would then lead to even more authority for people to lean in even more to hear about what they said about Jesus. And this historian who doesn't believe in the Christian faith, actually believes that this is the moment, the moment where Christianity became a movement, where this, this, this was like the, the spark on gasoline that caused it to spread. And the reason I bring this up is to say, one thing this historian realized is that there will be times when our adversaries who are against us in this world will believe that they are opposing us, silencing us, tamping down our message so that people can't do it, can't hear it. But what they're doing is actually exactly what God would want to have happen to have the message spread as quickly as possible. Our God is not only wise enough to provide us with the words to say at moments when we need to speak of Jesus Christ, to tell us what to say when we feel like, I have no idea how to respond to this. But God can also use the actions of those who are opposing the gospel to further spread the gospel. So that persecution that is against us, that, you know, nobody likes to be, you know, mocked, belittled, or ridiculed for talking of Christ. But God can actually use those moments when we are shamed to actually further spread the name of God. Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what we see here, because what the Sadducees did was the worst possible option for them and the best possible option for Christianity to haul Peter and John in, give them this public spectacle of a trial in the temple, and then let them go with basically no punishment. That is the worst thing they could have done, but it was also the best thing they could have done to spread the news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his miraculous power at this time. So God, God beautifully used what the priests were doing to oppose him. We need to remember that God can continue to do the same today. And now we have the response of Peter and John uh, to their ruling in verses 19 through 22. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen or heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing had been performed. And I think this must always be our response to any type of government censorship of the church, or if 
Our church even got to a point where our church was trying to censor you. Any type of government or religious censorship, we must always put the Word of God and the Bible first. We must always speak of what we have read and what we have discovered and what we have believed in the Holy Scriptures, even if it is costly to us. So if our government ever comes to us and says, you can talk about Jesus this way, but you can't talk about Jesus that way, we must be consistent to proclaim Jesus in the way in which he is presented in the Scripture. Jesus didn't die on the cross to make certain ways of salvation optional for people, but Jesus died on the cross so that he alone would be the Savior. And so we need to continue to proclaim him alone as the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I also want to say, if the government is limiting your speech or your behavior in a way that is not directly related to God's word, um, at that point, it is up to your personal conscience whether or not you're going to obey the laws or the standards the, that the government has put above you. That's between you and them and, and your conscience and the Lord. But if the government's coming and they're talking to you about how you can speak about Jesus and the gospel, and what is the truth in God's word? If they want to limit your speech on the word of God, you need to proclaim that I will speak of the Lord even if it will require imprisonment. I will speak of the Lord even if it will require my life. And one of the great things about being in the year 2024 and being almost 2,000 years into church history is that we not only have examples of people who have stood on the word um, of the Lord, such as Peter and John here in Acts chapter 4, but also we can look back at church history. And we have countless examples over hundreds of years of Christians who have been martyred for standing for the truth. We have second century Christians in North Africa who were cut off from their homes and driven away from society on account of their faith in Jesus Christ. And we should continue to proclaim his name even today if it becomes costly because our leaders have opposed us and the gospel. Uh, the other note made by Luke here in verses 21 through 22 is also to remind us how firm the testimony was of Peter and John, that the crippled that they healed uh, was not some random guy who, who faked his healing, uh, but one of the reasons that, that the crowd was so amazed was that this beggar had been sitting outside the gate for 40 years. And God had brought him miraculous healing at this point. So there's just no way the Sadducees were going to succeed in this moment. And again, like this historian said, they should have either killed Peter and John or just entirely ignored him. But instead, they took this situation and did the worst possible thing by slapping them on the wrists and letting them walk away. <coughs> Excuse me. But now we see uh, the response of the church to this first persecution in verses 23 through 31. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them who made by the mouth of your servant David have said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stands and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on the threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they are assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So the primary response to this first persecution was a prayer of praise. They praised the Lord. 
that they were privileged to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. They exalted God as the king, the maker of heaven and earth, and by drawing upon Psalm chapter 2 in verses 25 and 26, they provide a very astute observation in their prayer. And what they brought about from Psalm chapter 2 is this idea that the nations tried to rage against the Lord. That the nations tried to oppose God in a very specific way. And that is they, expo- they opposed God by opposing God's anointed one. And God's anointed one is the Christ. We need to remember how language, uh, how the word Christ works going from Hebrew to Greek to English is that in Psalm chapter 2, verse 2, uh, if you read that verse, it talks about the English, the anointed one in our English translations. Uh, but the anointed one in English is simply the Hebrew word Messiah. So if Messiah in Hebrew simply means anointed one. And if you were to translate the word Messiah or anointed one into Greek, the Greek word for Messiah is the word Christ. So Messiah, Christ, anointed one, all the same thing in three different languages. So Psalm chapter 2 is a clear messianic psalm. It is about the world opposing God's Messiah, God's Christ, God's anointed one. And John proclaims here uh, in this prayer that God had this opposition come to Christ, and that opposition was then totally in vain. Their raging was pointless. And even in this situation, not only was their rage pointless, but their rage also spread to the work of God. Because remember, what what did their raging of the nations against the Messiah first lead to? It led to the death and then the resurrection of Christ, the greatest good that God wanted. And then also we have here the the Sadducees, they continue to rage against God. They rage against the church. And what did this first persecution do to the church in Jerusalem? It was like pouring gasoline on the flame of their witness and causing the church to spread even more, which should then show us that while in the church, we should never purposefully seek out persecution. We we shouldn't want it to come upon us. But at the same time, when persecution does come upon those who are speaking of Jesus, we should welcome it. We should welcome the persecution because God uses the raging and the persecution of the world to, sp- of the world to spread the name of his son and to spread the numbers of his church. While it's impossible to find accurate numbers today, it's believed that the church in communist China is huge with an untold number of Christians, that it is consistently growing in spite of the persecution of the government and the now atheism that spread throughout the Chinese culture because that persecution is leading the church to spread even more. And in their prayer, the early church illustrated how this worked with the death of Jesus Christ in verses 27 and 28. The Jewish leaders opposed Jesus, but when they put him to death, their death did not end Jesus. It did not defeat Jesus, but it led to his greatest work and his greatest glory in the plans of God. So in the same way today with the church, we need to understand that while we don't want to do things that would stupidly cause people to persecute us, because we're jerks or we're idiots or we go out and purposely disobey laws for no reason whatsoever, we also need to understand that when people oppose the name of Jesus Christ, when when they threaten the advance of the church, that what God can do is use that persecution to spread the glory of his name. And what we're going to see in Acts very soon is that the persecution of the church in Jerusalem will be what is the impetus that gets the church out of Jerusalem and going into the world at large. Uh, But Peter makes a key request in the midst of this prayer, and that is that God would grant them all boldness to speak his word in verse 29. Because we need to understand that if persecution is going to have a positive effect on the world, one thing we need to do is we need to be bold to speak the truth. If the government decides to ramp up persecution against the church, 
if our neighbors and families come out against us for sharing our hope of the gospel, uh, nothing will advance if we cower and are not bold to continue to share. Then what we have here also after this prayer is what seems to be kind of like almost a second Pentecost as the Spirit comes upon the people who are there, uh, shakes the building, and then fills them with boldness. Now, there's a lot of theology you could get on the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Uh, that's one of the reasons I called this th series the Acts of the Holy Spirit, because uh, there's a lot on the Holy Spirit in this book. But one thing we, I do think we need to do is be cautious about using these narratives to speak about ways the Holy Spirit will always work or regularly work, because it's not guaranteed that the way the Spirit worked in this time will mean that he will work that way throughout church history. It doesn't mean that because he did something in Acts 4 that he's going to do it in River Ridge in this year. Uh, but I do believe one thing we can learn from this passage is that the Holy Spirit, who abides in every believer, who dwells in every person who believes in Jesus Christ, the Spirit does not always fill every person who is a believer. So while every person who places their faith in Jesus Christ is sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of redemption, we're kept secure through the Spirit's working. At the same time, a believer must also submit to and call upon the Holy Spirit in order to be filled by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, when I looked up this word filled uh, in the New Testament, I expected the most often the use is to be talking about filling a pitcher or filling a jar, something with liquid. Uh, but actually, the most common time in which this word filled is used is related to emotions. People being filled with anger or filled with joy, with the idea being that you have so much of that emotion in you that what that emotion honestly ends up doing is it ends up controlling your behavior. When you're filled with anger, you end up lashing out and acting in anger in ways that would not have happened if the emotion of anger was not filling your person. And so I believe that what uh, Luke is going for here when he talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit, and this is probably how, what Paul means when he talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, is to say that while the Holy Spirit is always present with us, the Holy Spirit isn't always filling us, which means the Holy Spirit isn't always guiding us, controlling us, leading us in the way that he wants us to go. So then the question is, how would we be filled by the Holy Spirit? Because I would love to be guided and controlled and directed by the Spirit in my life. Well, the verses around Ephesians 5.18 sort of let us know what we can do to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're filled by the Holy Spirit when we worship the Lord, when we give thanks to God, when we're in submission to the Lord, and when we are in community with his church. So what's brought up there in Ephesians 5 is that those who are filled with, this Holy, with the Holy Spirit are those who worship the Lord, those who give thanks to God, those who are submissive to God, and those who are in community with the church. So those are the four things that you need to do. And those are the things that are honestly going on right here in Acts chapter 4. This is why I think we can learn this lesson here, because I think what we see in Acts chapter 4 is what Paul brings out in instructions in Ephesians chapter 5. And that is this early church in Acts, what were they doing in this moment? They were praying to God, they were worshiping Him, that they were gathered together in community as a church. They were giving thanks to God that they were able to suffer for his name and talk about the name of Jesus Christ. And then finally, they were submissive to the Lord. They were willing to go and speak about Jesus Christ even before the Sadducees. And they had that great line of submission where they're like, you can't speak of this name anymore. And they're like, whoa, whoa, are we to obey God or are we to obey you? Uh, we're going to choose to obey the name of the Lord. And so they're submitting themselves to God. So they're filling all of the same steps that Paul will bring out later in Ephesians chapter 5. So this is letting us know that while the Holy Spirit's always with us, the Holy Spirit is not always filling us. And there's certain things the Holy Spirit says that are that Paul says through the inspiration of the Spirit that we should do in order to be filled by the Holy Spirit. We got to be people who worship God,
We got to be people who give thanks to God for what he has done. We got to submit to God's word. And then we got to gather together as a church. And if we do those things, then the Holy Spirit promises he will come and fill us, lead us, guide us, even I would say maybe control us as our emotions do. And my hope, though, is that during these times of relative safety right now, I mean, we're in River Ridge, Louisiana. Uh, I haven't had anybody come up to me midweek and be like, you know, somebody from the government came and knocked at my door and set, threatened to send me to prison uh, because I talked to my coworker about Jesus. Uh, we don't face that kind of direct physical persecution today. Uh, the persecution that we get is mostly the verbal kind. Uh, people say things that are unkind or hurtful for to us uh, because of our faith in Jesus Christ. So in these days of relative safety, uh, this is the time where I think we should always be preparing ourselves and being ready for those days when persecution may come. And I think there's two real basic ways to be ready for the days of persecution to come. One, we got to be people who pray for boldness. We got to follow that example of the old church and say, Lord, please help me to be bold in that day to speak of the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And then the second thing that we need to do is we need to be filled by the Holy Spirit, which is the four basic actions that the Spirit is calling us to do to be filled by him.